Well, we finished our series called Overcoming Temptation. And one of the unique things about this series is what we've been trying to do is help people identify the sin. Okay, Hebrews 12, 2 says uh, you, you need to, to throw off the sin that so easily trips you up. And, and we're all a little bit different, right? Like, like some people who struggle with overeating and some people don't. Other people are like, oh my gosh, I, I don't know how they can. I, I, some people struggle with alcohol. Others don't. Yeah, one sip and I was an alcoholic. And other people, they, they don't have a problem with it. Some people uh, overspending. Some people with lying. Some people with, I mean, every one of us is different. And we have our own the sin, okay? And so we, we're trying to help people identify that. Not so they can try harder not to do it, but so they can know and understand themselves so that they can pursue the things of the Spirit that will more likely help them to live in a different way, in a transformed way. So what we talked about is this, is know your the sin and quit focusing on sin management. Well, I'm never going to do that again. I swear I'll never do that again until the next time I do that again, and then I swear again that I won't do that again. And then I've done it so many times that I just quit swearing that I'm going to swear that I'm never going to do it again. And it's called apathy. And we just realize, well, maybe that's just the way God made me, and that's as good as it's ever going to get. Flesh cannot cast out flesh. Okay? So what happens is most people, as a pastor of 25 years, what I realize is, is we get saved and we receive the Holy Spirit, but we still try to do what has worked for us in the past. I'm going to try really hard. Now, I'm, okay, I'm a Christian. Now I'm going to be the best Christian I can be. I'm going to try real hard. To, uh, I'm going I'm to get in Christian shape. All right, and what we don't learn is that there's a new power source by which we live. So we learn in Romans 6 that capital S sin, the entity or force of sin, has been defeated. Well, then why do we still lowercase s sin? Sin has been defeated. We're no longer slaves. We no longer have to sin, but we still sin. And Scripture says it's because we live in this defeated flesh. Even though we've been set free, our, our desires and habitual habitual longings and patterns are still innate within us so that what we have to do is learn to not live by those desires but live by the power of the Holy Spirit who now has been placed within us. And so what we said is there are certain practices that can help you not try harder but can help you position yourself to be more attentive to the Holy Spirit to be uh, more discerning of the Spirit's voice and to keep in step with the Spirit. So we went from know what type you are. How many of you uh, took an Enneagram or took, took the profile? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, y'all. Take it. I'm tr tr trust me on this. Once you figure that out, you can f figure out your... Uh, your types. So go to the, the types. There's, there's three slides, and there are the nine types. One's called the reformer, two, the helper, three, the achiever. Their reformers are rational and, and uh, they're perfectionists. Okay, four, the, uh, yeah, sorry. Uh, you got ahead of me, then I got ahead of you. Okay. The individualists, they're sensitive and temperamental. The investigator, they're intense, they're cerebral, they're perceptive. The loyalists, they're uh, committed, they're security oriented, they're engaging. Um, the seven, the enthusiasts, they're fun loving, they're spontaneous, they're versatile. The challenger, they're powerful, they're dominating, they're self confident. The peacemaker, they're easygoing, self effacing, receptive. But each one of these personality types have a sin proclivity. For instance, um, a reformer, a one, is prone to anger. A two, the helper, is prone to pride. A three, the achiever, is prone, uh, prone to deception. He wants everyone to see what he wants them to see. He's an achiever. And so, how are you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> I'm so good, I'm going to have to hire you to help. All right? And they may be having the worst day ever, right? And so, each of these types 
has a sin proclivity. Not that we all don't struggle with pride. Not that we all don't struggle with anger. It's that certain types struggle with certain more than. And so there are the spiritual disciplines. Go back to that slide that you had up before the three slides. The spiritual disciplines can come alongside. Um, and so if you want to go from anger as a one to someone who's peaceful, then you practice uh, celebration. All right? So celebration is this thing where perfectionists, they're always mad because nothing's ever right. Well, you practice celebration and you start celebrating. You know what? It may have not been perfect, but darn it, we did, we did well this quarter. Let's throw a party. Instead of going, we didn't hit our numbers this quarter, we were 1% short, and so no one's getting raises. The, instead of that, you go, you know what? Hey, we almost hit that. Way to go, y'all. Let's all go to Dave and & Buster's, and here's $10. You know, and celebrate. And that's a spiritual discipline to help you overcome your tendency to be angry that the world's not perfect. Are you with me? Yeah. All right. Every one of you has a proclivity, and that bent toward a particular sin isn't something that you can drive out with effort. Flesh cannot drive out flesh, but spirit can drive out flesh. And so what you do is you practice spiritual disciplines to help you hear and know and respond to the Holy Spirit of God. Are you with me? All right, so here's where we're going today. These spiritual practices are simply, they don't make more of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a person. You can't, you can't get more of him once you got him. He can have more control of you, though. Okay? And so what you want to do, these practices position you to avail yourself, to give yourself more to the Holy Spirit of God. So here's how it works. In Romans 7, in verse 5, it says this. When we were controlled by the sinful flesh, again, NIV says nature, no, that, that's not true, it's flesh. Old nature was done away with, you have received a brand new nature, that's why you're a new creation in Christ, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. But you still are in this flesh, even though your new, uh, your new nature is still trapped in this flesh, and this flesh has been habituated to want what it wants. Wah! All right? And we're driven by habits and patterns. The sinful passions aroused by the law, the Ten Commandments, were at work in our bodies. What? You mean the law was working against me? Scripture says, no, the law is good. But what the law does is you're walking down the sidewalk and the law says, do not step on the grass. And immediately your sinful flesh goes, right? So the law is good, but what it does is it provokes this sinful flesh pattern. All right. So he says, by dying to what was once bound, we have been released from the law so that we serve in the new way, the new way of the Spirit. The old way is the written code. Okay. I'm going to summarize the most difficult chapter, one of the most difficult chapters in Scripture, Romans 7. Here's the summary. Sin, that stuff we do, stepping on the grass, is the byproduct of spiritual pursuit without spiritual means. God says, I want you to live this way, and so we try really hard to live this way, and we can't because we're trying hard to do it. And he says, I gave you the law so that you would come to the end of yourself. I gave you the law, which is good. This is how I want you to live, so that you would realize you can't live this way. And then I sent my son to take on that which is incapable of you, flesh. And he was born of the Spirit. He was filled with the Spirit. And he was led by the Spirit. And he lived the life that I've called you to live. And he lived it to show you how you can now live. And the old covenant was simply there to say, you can't do it. What? Yep, God knows us so well that until we got to rock bottom and just said, 
I've tried to keep the law. 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 I mess up all the time. I can't do it. And he's like, that's right. You can't. And so I've sent my son to remove capital S sin to free you and to show you how to live by the Spirit. Jesus walked out of heaven. He came down to earth. He showed us by the power of the Holy Spirit how to live. Many Christians I know who got saved and received the Holy Spirit are still doing the Barney Rubble. Anybody remember what, who Barney Rubble was? Okay, let's come up with a different analogy. <laughs> it's like you have a Corvette, and instead of turning it on, you get out and you push. You've received the new life of the Holy Spirit of God, and yet you just put it in neutral. This is such a cool car. And that's what you're doing. And you're tired, and you're exhausted, and you're worn out because it's all you know to do. Why? Because everybody else is in a really cool car, and they're doing the same thing. And then every now and then you see a car go by that's engine is on, and the guy is driving, and he zooms by, and all the people, the majority of the people that are out there pushing their car go, show off. See, he's just one of those exceptional, abnormal, there's only a few people really like that. Sad but true, there's only a few people of them, but it is available to everyone. You just got to turn the ignition over. And the ignition is the awareness that we no longer have to live by effort, but we can live by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ the law of the Spirit of life has set us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh that we're in, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful man to be the sin offering. And so he condemned sin in sinful, in order that, in sinful flesh, in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fully met in us. Those who have their minds set on the flesh produce flesh. In other words, look, if you're still trying hard not to do bad, you're going to do bad. Why? Because you're trying to do it in your flesh. Flesh produces flesh. Any light bulbs? Okay, okay, thank you. But once you realize, oh, it's not about that. It's about learning how to live in the new way of the Spirit. The minds set on what the nat nature desires who live according to the Spirit have their minds set on what the Spirit desires. What does the Spirit desire? We don't answer it. What, what does the Spirit desire for you? Don't, don't, don't answer it. What's the Spirit desire for you today? What did He desire for you yesterday? What does he desire, did He desire for you last week? What did He desire for you last year? If you don't know the answer to what the Spirit desires, during this last worship set, the Holy Spirit of God pressed upon me something I don't want to do, but I must do. And I just said, okay, I'll do that. Yes. I know his voice. I know how he speaks to me. And I'm sitting there worshiping, and all of a sudden, a thought comes into my mind. And I'm like, oh, mm. okay. Okay. Your will be done. If you don't know what he desires for you, and you can't remember the last time you knew a, you don't have the Spirit of God within you. The Scripture says in Romans 8 that the Spirit of God testifies to our spirit that we're children of God. 
or B, you have grieved or quenched the Holy Spirit of God, meaning the last time the Holy Spirit of God said, I want you to do this, you went, eh, I'll get back to you. And so what happens is when you hunger and you long for and you thirst for the Spirit of God, you recognize when you have grieved Him and when you have quenched Him. You've grieved Him and quenched Him when you haven't heard from Him. And you're not aware of what He desires. You can't remember the last time you were aware of what He desired. But then when you learn that cycle that I've quenched Him and I've grieved Him because I did not keep in step with Him because I was not living life by Him, I was living on my own terms. And you get back to the end of yourself again. Oh, I'm done with that. Rock bottom again. Here I am again, Lord Jesus, right back to rock bottom. And I remember, I can't live the spirit by the power of the flesh. And so I surrender once again. And I'm going to go back to where I heard you last. And the last time you said this to me and I said no to you. And now I'm going to say yes to you, Lord. Because I want more of you. And I want to live by the power that you've placed in me. I am sick and tired of living this self-condemnation, guilt, empty loop cycle. So one or two things are true. If you don't know what the Spirit desires, you either have not heard from the Holy Spirit of God or you have grieved and quenched Him and so you need to go right back. Do not pass go. Do not collect $200. Go right back. Y'all get that in? Was y'all get that illustration? Okay, because my dad jokes are getting bad the older I get, so I'm trying to come up with some new stuff. All right, all right. So we go from being consciously incompetent, what Paul says, I do not do what I want to do, and what I want to do, I don't do. We go from being consciously incompetent, I want to, but I can't, to consciously competent. So what does that look like? That looks like when we set our minds on the Holy Spirit and we set our minds on what the Spirit desires. Galatians 5 says it this way. So I say, live by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are at conflict with each other. So that you do not do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the sinful flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft. And most of us at this point are going, see, I'm just totally led by the Spirit. I haven't done witchcraft in forever. But then he goes on and said, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, hello America, dissension, factions, hello denominationalism, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. See, what happens is most of us, we read these lists and we start going, well, I'm doing pretty good. I haven't been in an orgy in years. But what we don't do is identify with where we struggle. He says, and the like. Ellipses, dot, dot, dot. Meaning the list goes on and on and on. And so you might put your nose up in the air because you haven't done some of these licentious, ugly sins. You just sit around and judge others. That's your preferred sin. You know, you can dress up the flesh all you want, but it will never produce the fruits of the Spirit. Judgmental criticism is not righteousness. It's just flesh dressed up. Then he goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit, the byproduct, what the Spirit produces is love, joy, peace. 
peace, helicopter mom. The fruit of the Spirit produces peace. He produces peace in your finances. He produces peace in your kids' grades. He produces peace in whether your kid's going to be perceived as a good kid or a failure or whatever. It's not about you, by the way. It's about your kid. And God's responsibility entrusted you to raise them by the Spirit. Patience. The reason I get in the longest line at HEB is because whichever line I get in is going to be the longest line anyway. Because it could be one person in front of me and ten people in the line over there. But if I get in front of this one, she's going to have some kind of thing go wrong. And so you know what? I don't want to have false expectations, so I just get in the longest line so I can practice patience. And just say, Lord, I'm good. Because you know if I think there's a line that I should get out faster... I'm going to be grumpy and mean and mad and impatient. And so I don't want to live that way. And so I'm just going to go over here and get the longest line because you're good. That's a spiritual discipline. You can make up your own. If if you didn't like the one on the list I put up earlier, this is just getting the longest line of H-E-B, spiritual discipline. In order to produce, to position yourself, to position yourself to be led and controlled by something other than your flesh, whose name is the Holy Spirit of God. And Holy Spirit of God, I'm getting in this line because I don't want to be that guy. And the only way I cannot be that guy is to be completely surrendered to you. And so I'm good here in this log line. Is there something else you would like me to do here? Could I pay for her groceries? Could I ask if I could pray for her? Is there something else you got me up to right now? That's living. That's the life. And it is good. But we never learned because we joined a bunch of Corvette owners who put it in neutral and every week get together in the church parking lot on the weekends and see who can push the fastest. And every now and then one goes blazing down Hebner, and we're like, wow, yeah, that happens every now and then, but they're special. They're like super spiritual people. No, they're just the ones that turned over the ignition and are under another power source other than their own. Here's what I want you to do today as we close. I want you to identify Where do you need to grow? What fruit is it that God wants you to produce? Where do you need to produce the most of? Is it love? Is it kindness? Is it goodness? Is it faithfulness? Peace, patience, gentleness, self-control? How do I produce this fruit? You don't. But what you do is you position yourself to rely upon the Holy Spirit of God who can produce that fruit in you and say, oh, Lord God, I need to be more gentle with my my teenager. And man, I'm telling you, it's not easy for me to do right now, but Lord, I need to be more gentle. And so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to start practicing spiritual discipline of celebration, or spiritual discipline of gratitude, or spiritual discipline of journaling, and I'm going to journal every night of how grateful I am for that kid, and I'm going to journal every night of how grateful I am that you blessed me with him, and all the kind attributes, and all the good things that I see in him, remind me once again, oh God, and I'm going to surrender, and allow you to fill me with the grace, and the kindness, and the peace, and the mercy, and the love that I need to pour out upon this child, Lord God, help me to grow in kindness. Help me to grow in gentleness. What is the one that you identified for yourself? I know you've already identified the one for your spouse, but what's the one, <laughs> what's the one you've identified for yourself? And then go before the Lord and say, Lord, show me. And learn about the spiritual disciplines and the different ways to position yourself before the Holy Spirit. And ask yourself this question each and every minute of each and every day. Holy Spirit, 
What is it that you desire? Because if you're not living out the desires of the Spirit, you're living out the desires of the flesh. You know what your flesh wants. If I ask you what you want right now, and you're going to tell me I want to go to Whataburger, you're going to tell me I want this, or I want this promotion, or I want to swipe right, or I want whatever it is. You know what your flesh wants. The other question is this, what does the Spirit desire? And if you're not asking that question, you are not living. Because the sinful flesh is dead and defeated. But life is in the Spirit. If you're here today and you don't know what it means to have the Spirit of God, Scripture says that the Spirit of God testifies to your spirit that you're a child of God. In other words, if you possess the Holy Spirit of God, you know it. And if that's not true of you, you're on the treadmill of religion. You're pushing the Corvette. What scripture says is that by faith, you trade in your old life, meaning you give up all rights to yourself. And you say, I lay down my life, Jesus, and I want what you did for me. I want to accept your life. I want to accept your spirit. Well, Pastor Jeff, I did that. If you did, and you really did it, you would receive the Holy Spirit, and you would know the Holy Spirit if you've got him. If you didn't, you just wanted someone to give you a free pass to heaven, that's not the same thing as turning over all rights to yourself and your life to follow Jesus and live by his strength and his power alone. The way that you exchange your life is you pray a prayer and it goes something like this and you can pray it right where you are. You say, Heavenly Father, I lay down my rights to myself. I want to die with Jesus, and I want to be resurrected with Jesus, and I want to live his life by his spirit and by his power. I want to be new. And so I surrender it all. Change me, fill me. Whatever you say, I will say yes. I will follow because I'm done. I've tried it this way. And it's empty and weary. And so I give you my life. If any of you prayed that prayer in your heart or in your head, then that's called the exchange life. And in that moment, you lay down your rights and you receive the Spirit of God to live the life of Jesus. Not your life, you're living his life now. And if you prayed that prayer, I'm going to ask you just to reach your hand up and I'm going to ask you, thank you to reach into the seat back in front of you, or if you're in the front row, reach in the seat back behind you, and fill out the next step card. Here's why. When the Holy Spirit of God comes to live inside of you, if you don't learn how to turn the ignition over, then what you'll do is you'll end up running around like a bunch of us did for years, pushing the Corvette. We wax it, we wash it, we make it look really good, and then we all get out in the parking lot because we think that's what we do because so many people are doing it that way. Fill out the next step card so that you can learn how to listen to the voice of the Holy Spirit of God, how to obey and discern, and how to grow and understand what it means to live the Christ life. If you're here today and you prayed that prayer and you grieved or quenched the Holy Spirit years ago by saying, I give you my life, oh, nope, I take it back. I want to be saved, but I want to be in control. Then you are saved, and you will be in heaven, but you are functionally dead. You know why there's so many shows about zombies on TV now? It is a metaphor to all the Christians in the world who are not living by the power of the Spirit. I'm convinced of it. Every show is about zombies and vampires, the living dead. Hello? If you got saved and you're not living by the Spirit, you're hungry. And if that's you, I want you to surrender and say, Father, forgive me. I'm so slow to learn this lesson. I can never live your life in my own strength. 
Spirit of God, wherever I said no to you, I don't even remember it's been so many years, wherever I said no to you, I confess that and I lay it before you. Teach me again. Give me another chance to say yes to you, to step out in faith and obedience, to experience the rush once again of what it means to be under the power and control of the Spirit of God. And that that's true of you. That's why we're having communion this morning. We're going to close this service. Band's going to come. They're going to play this song. As they play this song, we use the Lord's Supper as a time of reflection to reflect on what Jesus has done for us and to remind ourselves once again of our great and desperate need for him. And scripture says and when you take the Lord's Supper, you examine yourself. And so if there's something going on in you that is not jiving with the life that God has called you to live, then you lay it before him. We call this doing kingdom business. And we say, God, I'm getting rid of this lie, and I'm replacing it with truth. And I confess my lust. I confess my greed. I conf whatever it is, my anger, I confess. Whatever it is, I just lay it before you. And I've been living by my own strength, and I'm tired, and I'm worn out, and I'm back to ground zero. And I see it all fresh again. I cannot live the life of the Spirit apart from the Spirit. I surrender. So I want you to bow your head and close your eyes. As we do this, our ushers are going to come. You're doing business with God. You can go before uh, the cross under here, our prayer team, if you want to pray with someone. As the cups are being passed, remember that there are two cups. One has the cracker in it. One has the juice, so make sure you get two cups. As they're passed, pass the plate. But if you want to get up and go and pray with someone, the prayer teams are under the cross. If you want to kneel, do that. Um, if you don't get a cup because you went and prayed, go back and grab one. Hang on to it. We'll take the elements together after they've all been passed out. Let us sing this song over you, or you can sing it with us, but you respond to how the Holy Spirit of God is leading you. The great thing about the Passover and the Lord's Supper is that Jesus did the Lord's Supper on the same night as the Passover, meaning he utilized a long-held commemoration of the Jewish people as they left slavery in Egypt and transformed it into something new. The Passover was when the angel of the Lord passed over every home that had the blood over the doorpost. They celebrate that meal and then Jesus comes and he says, look, I'm doing something new. The old covenant, based on the law, you could not do. Flesh cannot produce spirit. And so I have come to lay down my life. I came in the flesh to be one of you, and I shed my blood to pay for your sin. But I came in the flesh to model for you what it means to live the new life, to live the divine nature, to live by the power of the Holy Spirit. So I, God, came to be one of you, to show you the new and the better way. And so, whenever you take the bread and drink the cup, remember, remember me because I am the way, the truth, the life. He took the bread and he broke it and passed it out to his disciples and he says, whenever you eat of this bread, remember me. In the same way, he took the cup and he said, this is the new covenant, the new covenant, not symbolized by tablets of stone. This is the new covenant in my blood, symbolized by flesh inhabited by spirit. As often as you take of this cup, remember me. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, a revolutionary who came to set the world upside down. 
He transformed our way of thinking. He transformed our understanding. And yet somewhere along the way, we fell back into the rut of just trying hard, trying to do stuff in our own flesh. We quit apprehending, but the only way to truly be alive, to live your life is by your spirit, to being in touch with what the spirit desires and keeping in step with the spirit and living out of that identity and that power source and strength. So we recommit ourselves today as we remember Jesus, our light, our life, our savior, and the way. And as he lived, he has now provided us that we too can live in that way. So Lord God, give us a hunger and a thirst and a passion and a desire and obsession and addiction to be filled with and controlled by your spirit that the world would know by the way we live as we produce the fruit that only you can do. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. As you head out this morning, uh, the love offering taken at the door is for people who have fallen on difficult times that are part of our community. It could be a light bill, it could be a medical bill, but if God impresses upon you to give to the love offering, uh, just be obedient to the Spirit today. God bless you. We'll see you next weekend.